Hey, Stephanie. Hey, Kirill. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. I'm doing all right. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing good. I'm so excited to do this interview with you. Um, I'm Stephanie, the English coach, and I help intermediate to advanced English learners uh, online improve their fluency and confidence in English. And, you know, I teach communication and networking skills. And it's really interesting how I got into this because I wasn't like a kid that said, one day I want to grow up and be an English teacher or an English coach. I actually had my own experiences learning a foreign language and mastering a foreign language. I learned Spanish and it has been a long journey, okay? I started learning when I was 14 and then going from everything where you're studying traditional, uh, studying in traditional classes, studying grammar, to really being able to speak the language. I mean, there's so much that goes on there. And after having my own experiences, you know, learning Spanish and mastering Spanish and then living in a foreign country and seeing, I lived in Argentina for five years. So then seeing, you know, um, people struggle with English. I was, you know, I was like, man, I really want to do something to help these people improve their English. I know what it's like. So that's basically how I got started. And how many other languages um, do you speak? Well, I only speak Spanish fluently because that was the language I was most dedicated to learning. But um, I also took a class in college to start learning Portuguese. And ever since, you know, I took that class, I've been really interested in uh, the Portuguese language. And it's, it's kind of weird. After you learn your first foreign language, I feel like learning languages almost becomes easy. So I've picked up a lot of Italian just from traveling to Italy. And because my husband studies Italian, I've picked up some Russian also, by the way, from my Russian friends. Oh, I seriously? Russian friends. S yeah, yeah, Say yeah. something in Russian, please. I'm dying to hear. Um, uh, Katlietka. Katlietka, wow. Okay. What, what does that mean, Katlietka. by the way? Oh, okay. It's a, a small piece of meat. Okay. Minced, yeah, that's... Minced, like kind of put together, you know, and and uh, cooked in uh, in a frying pan. Like a patty. Lots, we lots call them patties. Yeah, probably. Yeah. This is really funny because I have so many um, Russian friends, and I'm always eating with them, <laughs> and they're always telling me the names of their Russian foods, and so I know a lot of Russian words, but I sometimes forget, you know, what it means. Okay, I see. And can you say a whole sentence in Russian? Like not just one word, but a whole sentence. For example, like introduce um, yourself or anything. Okay, I don't, I don't think I know that much Russian, but I could say like privet. Um, I, I, I understand a few words. Okay, but I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. Under, unfortunately, I don't know a sentence. For, I can try repeating one though, if you want to tell me one. You know, your pronunciation in Russian is amazing. Seriously, the r letter, the one everybody is struggling with while learning Russian, it's amazing. I mean, oh, thank you. Did you pick it up from uh, learning Spanish? Um, probably because, you know, in Spanish, you have to learn to roll your R's and Russian has very, a very strong R. In fact, that's one of the sounds that, you know, Russian native speakers struggle with in English. They carry over the strong R sound from their language and try to insert it into the English language. Okay. But English doesn't have a strong sound. So I honestly try to make my pronunciation as accurate as possible in every language. And so when people hear me say words in Portuguese or in Italian or French or whatever, they go, wow, your pronunciation is really good. And I think that's just because I try to say it exactly as I hear it, if that okay, makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, it perfectly does. Okay, I see. Great. Okay, so you're doing a great job. You got a knack for learning languages, I can tell you for sure. Okay, and um, uh, so you speak Spanish fluently that's great mm -hmm. so you know um rumor has it that you can master a language in like three months well mm -hmm. a lot of at least a lot of english teachers uh somewhere in russia ukraine some post soviet countries they say that it's actually possible and if you start from scratch you could just go to upper intermediate or um advanced in like a couple of months so mm -hmm. do you believe in that and how long did it take you to master uh spanish Okay, so there's usually this saying or in English, we say, if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is. Um, and this is the same like magic solution that gets sold in every industry. Whatever people want to master, there's always going to be somebody selling you the idea that you can do it in three months and that it's not going to cost you anything. But common sense, you know, tells you that that's not true. And so I think it's really important for us to do our research um, and to ask around like what you're doing because it, it just doesn't work like that. So 
there are, you know, for some people it takes a long time for me, honestly, to really truly master Spanish to the point where I have where I can speak and sound like a native speaker. That took me years, over a decade for sure. Wow. Um, and really, I only got confident, like super confident a year ago. But the confidence had nothing to do with my fluency because at that point I had already been fluent for years. Um, I just totally lacked confidence and I was always aware of my mistakes and thinking about, you know, Oh, people aren't going to understand me or I'm going to mess up. And that's a mindset issue. So once I fixed my mindset and I was like, you know what? I speak this language, you know, people understand me. That's and it, that is when I finally allowed myself to have confidence. But um, so learning the language, it can happen, you know, faster or slower, depending on your personal level of motivation and how much you study and your brain too. Okay. Some people's brains are going to maybe pick it up a little bit faster than others. So you, you have to be patient with yourself basically. That's right. So confidence and the ability to speak the language, um, they are kind of two different things, right? So to build up conf uh, in order to build up some confidence, you have to change something here inside your head. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. And the thing though, is that if you lack confidence, that affects your ability to speak. I am a better Spanish speaker now than I was a year and a half ago, because a year and a half ago, since I lacked confidence, a, a lot of times I wouldn't even speak because I was afraid of making mistakes. Even though I had all the grammar down, I had everything down, the accent down, I had it all down perfectly, basically, I was still so afraid to speak. So your confidence will directly affect your ability. When you decide to be confident, all of a sudden you're going to unleash this power within yourself where you're just like, wow, I didn't know I was this good at English. Okay. So uh, I see it as if you could become confident just like that, just like, just by changing something inside your mm -hmm. head instantly. Mm -hmm. Right. So mm -hmm. that's, kind of a mindset, as you just said, and exactly. uh, that's what's important, right? So it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to know all the rules and all the words there are in the language, right? Oh, absolutely. And you know what? Um, for the people who struggle with confidence, I think this message is important. There are people out there, believe it or not, and I envy them, who don't struggle with this at all. Like my husband, for example, he got fluent in English extremely fast, but there were a few things that I think made this possible. It's like the perfect situation. First, he met me. So we were speaking English every day together. And when I first met him, he had a horrible accent. I could barely understand him, but he insisted on speaking with me. And I'm like, I'm trying to practice my Spanish with you because he's from Argentina. Okay. Um, so... Anyhow, he got fluent very, very fast because he was speaking with me every day and he has zero shame. I mean, this man does not care if he messes up. He does not care what you think about his accent. Um, he just does not care. And I think that was the perfect equation for him to advance so rapidly. That's right. Okay. So guys, grow yourself some thick skin and don't pay yeah. attention to critics and stuff, right? Okay, right. Um, so uh, what about um, his pronunciation and his fluency now. So does he sound exactly like you? No, he does not. He does not sound like a native speaker because he d that's not his goal. And this is something that's really interesting too. It's like people get good at what they care about getting good at. So he does not care about his accent. He is totally okay with having an accent and everything. Um, sometimes I get on him because I'm like, you cannot be married to the English coach and still mispronouncing certain words. This is not okay. <laughs> and I get on him sometimes about his pronunciation. But overall, like he, his pronunciation has improved, but naturally, not because he's been working at it, but simply because he's just using the language so much. And okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. I see. Good. And um, let's use your husband as an example, because we already started, kind of started, right? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, what, do you remember some of the uh, greatest challenges, some of the obstacles he had to overcome uh, on his way to fluency? Mm, honestly, he made it look so easy. I'm trying to remember what he did. Okay, because his journey and my journey were completely different. I'm the girl that did, you know, I don't know, six or more years in traditional education, college, university classes, um, everything. Like I, you know, I studied grammar. He didn't do any of that. So that's also why a lot of the times I encourage people to study the way he did, because out of both of us, who's the one that learned faster? He learned way faster. Yeah, right. um, and it was not nearly as much of a challenge as it was for me. For so I think his methods are so much better. Um, 
you know, he would just consume information in English. He would just, you know, read stuff online in English, talk with me in English, listen to music in English. And he just made it a daily part of his life. And that really helped. Okay. So guys, just make sure you make English part of your lives and uh, spend with the language as much time as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's how you actually learn not just going to classes and you know learning the language like two hours a week. It's not going to propel you to fluency, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Um, so um, I lived in the south of the United States. So I live in Alabama. So uh, I hope my accent is not southern, is it? No, it's not. It's not. Okay, good. Uh, because I wasn't trying to pick up the, the, the local accent at all. <laughs> so I wanted to keep it kind of clean. And... Um, Let's talk about some accents around the United States. So probably people speak kind of a little bit differently. If, for example, you are from California and some other guy or girl is from New York, let's say, or Florida. Mm -hmm. So could you please tell uh, me and my subscribers something about um, different accents within the United States. So how do they change and what are the differences? Maybe you could give us a couple of examples. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, since I grew up in California, I was pretty much exposed to, you know, Californian accents all my life. Right. And, um, most people, I guess you could say, speak the same here, but there are going to be differences even in one state and one region, depending on how much education the person has, how they identify um, as a person. Like, you know how you meet those people that use a lot of slang, right? I don't use a lot of slang, but some people like that's part of their culture. That's part of their identity using slang. Um, And then, I don't know, like maybe wealthier people have an extremely precise way of talking or something like that. That's part of their identity. That's how they like um, portraying themselves. So even within the same city, okay, you can have so many different ways of speaking depending on how people identify. For example, a Mexican-American that grew up maybe even not even speaking Spanish, they're going to maybe speak a little bit differently than me because they grew up around their family who has a Mexican um, Spanish accent and they're going to identify with that. So that is going to influence the way that they speak, the tone of their voice, the vocabulary they use. So that's, I just wanted to point that out because sometimes I think, you know, people perceive accents in a country as, oh, in, in the South, there's this accent. In the Midwest, there's this accent. But really, within the same region, you can have multiple different um, dialects and accents and ways of speaking. So as far as like generalized American accents, um, obviously, we have the Southern accent or um, another one. I don't... Give me an example, please. Okay, there, southern accent, please. Oh, like to do it? To do a Southern accent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you? Well, I don't really know if I'm going to be able to do this well. You know, if someone from the South heard me talking like this, they probably think, oh my gosh, that is not how we talk. (laughs) But (laughs) nice to me because I do recognize those sounds those people were making, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I try, but if someone hears me, they're going to think I'm an idiot and they're going to be like, no, that is not how we talk. Um, So yeah, so you have a Southern accent. Um, Something that I've really been enjoying is watching series, um, TV series that take place in different parts of the U.S. because they use the accents. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I never knew they talk like this. So for example, I was watching the series Fargo and it's from Minnesota, Minnesota. Like that's how they talk. They talk a little bit like this and they say, excuse me, you're in my way. Um, So like the way they talk is so funny to me. And you know what happened after watching that series, like every single day, some of their words would come out of my mouth. Like I'd say way instead of way. And I'm just like, oh, it's happening to me. And right now I'm watching Justified and that takes place in Kentucky. So I get to hear that like it's kind of like a southern accent but it's a little bit different i don't know it's like the way the 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 main character is kind of like a cowboy kind of guy so they yeah the the words they use and the way they speak it's so interesting great and what about the differences between american english and british english okay so there are i saw your stories the other day that you were doing some pretty good (laughs) british accent there so it was really really funny so Oh, my British accent, it's, it's not good, but I try. 
yeah, but... I, yeah, it's just fun for me, I guess, to practice. You, you have to. And this is something I think a lot of language learners are afraid to do. They're afraid to play with their voices. Um, but, you know, we're all born with the same vocal tract, vocal apparatus. We all have tongues. We all have throats. We're all capable of making these different sounds. Um, but if you never try, you know, or if you don't play with it, you'll never realize it, what your, what your voice can actually do. But anyways, as far as differences between, you know, British and American English, here's what I'll say. There are many differences, right? You can hear someone speaking British English and American English sounds completely different. They use different vocabulary. Um, even within the UK, there are different accents, just like in the US. And what I will say about this is I was in London and I struggled to understand people. <laughs> so when you, this, it's like people need to know this. When you travel and you're like, oh my gosh, I couldn't understand the locals guess what? Neither could I. <laughs> and Ireland was worse. I could not understand like anybody there. And their accent was almost comical to me. It took me a while to get used to. You know what? There's, this is really funny. I can't, I can't give you examples of words because I didn't understand them. <laughs> right. Um, but here's what I, I can tell a couple stories that will illustrate what was difficult to understand and how I handled the situation. Cause there basically, I think that's the important thing. You're going to not understand people. Sometimes it's how you handle the situation. So there was, um, a time when my husband and I were staying with a couple in Ireland and whenever they would talk between themselves, I, would have sworn that they were speaking a foreign language. And I asked them, I'm like, hey, you know, was that English? They're like, yeah, that was English. I'm like, oh my gosh, I did not understand anything. When they would speak to me though, they would clear up their accent a little bit so that we could be understood, which was helpful. Now my husband, um, cause we were helping them with some stuff around the house. It was a work exchange program. It was really cool. It's called workaway.info. If anyone wants to check this out, it's <laughs> a plug for free room and board in exchange for work. So this is a free way to travel around the world. Not many people know about it. Anyways, we did this for five weeks in Ireland and one day I know it is really cool. Um, and one day we were, uh, my husband was painting or he was going to paint one of their rooms and, uh, he, he was like, okay, so how do you want me to do it? And the guy explained everything. My husband did not understand. Now my husband's not a native English speaker, so he has even more problems with this than I do. And so instead of just saying, I don't understand you, he would repeat what he thought he heard. And he would say, okay, so you want me to do X, Y, Z. And then the guy would either say, yes, that's right. Or no, I want it like this. And then after, if he would say no, my husband would say, okay, so you want me to do it like this, you know, and just getting the information so that he could do his work. Basically. Okay, so we have to persist until you mm -hmm. actually understand what, what, what's happening, right? So yeah. there, there are some ways to communicate. So you got to find them. Sometimes it's not easy, you know, and especially for beginners, for those who just start learning the language, um, when it comes to English, they are very afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, to ask you to repeat things, you know, when they when they didn't catch something, they're really afraid to ask. But I think that people shouldn't be afraid to ask to repeat things and to explain things differently, right? So that's that's mm -hmm. a very good piece of advice that we yeah can and. And I think people need to realize like the importance of what's at stake. I used to do the same thing. You know, I would be too embarrassed in Spanish to say, Hey, I actually didn't understand you, but guess what? If you don't clarify, then all of a sudden you can find yourself in a bigger problem where you've done something wrong because you didn't clarify and you didn't get the correct information. So there's, there should be no embarrassment in not understanding, um, you know, just clarify and move on. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Okay. And, you know, a lot of people are um, really concerned about how to um, get rid of this habit of translating things inside their own heads from their native language into English, for example. So do you have any advice on that? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, for me, that came with time. That came with a lot of time. So you do have to be patient on that end. If you've been studying for one year or two years, you might still have this problem. It might come by the time you've been really immersed in English for five years, okay? Because your brain has to make a switch. Here's the thing. There are very few things that can ever be translated word for word, right? Idioms are a perfect example of something that cannot be translated word for word because it makes no sense. You have to translate the idea. But what people don't realize is that sentence structure can usually almost never be translated word for word either, right? In Spanish, 
everything is reversed in a sentence. You know, the, the subject goes here, the verb goes there, everything is different. So, you know, once you understand the patterns of a language and start speaking in those patterns, you're no longer translating from your native language. You're using the new language, the way native speakers use it. And I remember when I first got to Argentina, I was doing a lot of the translating in my head and everything. And I realized I am speaking in a very robotic way because this is not the way they speak. So I just listened more and I looked for patterns. You know, how do native speakers express this idea? And then I would express it the way they would express it. And this meant that I had to really let go of my native language in a way and, and stop the stop trying to translate everything um, because there are some ideas that you just can't translate. There are some things you just can't translate. Like I remember when I would, um, when I first came to Argentina, I would try to say, I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait to see you on Friday. Or I can't wait to do that. That expression, I can't wait. They don't say that in Spanish. They don't say no puedo esperar. Like mm -hmm. literally I can't wait. That's so stupid. So instead you change the idea. Instead of saying like, I can't wait, maybe you say I'm looking forward to seeing you or cool. We get to see each other on Friday or something. You change the entire idea like words, but it essentially means the same thing. You're essentially showing your excitement for something that is to come. Okay. I see. Yeah. That's, that's very important and very interesting. So first of all, you have, you need time, then you need to emulate the way native speakers say certain things, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to learn the structures by heart so that you don't think about how to put all these words together because in Russian, the word order is flexible. In mm -hmm. Russian, you can, you can switch words, you know, you can put them wherever you want and you, you will still be understood by others. But in English, it doesn't work like that. So you have a positive and negative and an interrogative sentences and you have to keep your word order straight and you have to uh, follow certain rules when you form your sentences. That's very important. And when you get used to doing that, so then you can start uh, thinking in the foreign language, in the language. Yeah, I think maybe what people don't realize is that in the beginning, you do have to sort of study the structures side by side, learn the word order, learn the patterns, but eventually you absorb that and it becomes a part of you. And it's like, you just know, you don't even have to think, oh, how do I say this thing? You just know you have the pattern incorporated, but that, you know, like you said, that takes time. Yeah, right. Okay. And um, I have another question, a very interesting one. What are some of the mistakes that native English speakers make? For example, Americans, I'm sure that you guys make mistakes when you talk to each other on a daily basis, don't you? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. So I wrote down a couple examples, and this is something that I have heard lots of people say. I, I've I think I may have talked about it on my YouTube channel and then some native speakers will comment and say, no, nobody talks like that. But the thing is, you know, <laughs> they do because I've heard them and I've been taking notes on this. And it's not to say that everybody makes this mistake, but lots of people are doing it. Um, and so it exists. But for example, saying have went or have ate, it technically should be have gone or have eaten. But in the sentence, um, you know, like, let's say my friend says, oh, I, I went to the party and I say, oh, you know what? Like, I wanted to go. And then they, they say, well, you could have went with me. Like, why didn't you call me? You could, you could have went. Um, you could have went. It should be you could have gone. But a lot of people now are saying you could have went. Same thing with um, if I say, oh, my gosh, my stomach hurts so much. I ate a lot of food. Someone can say, well, you could have ate less. You could have ate less. It should be you could have eaten less. But what I've noticed in language is that we always tend to shorten things, right? If something starts seeming too long or whatever, people, they, we say we get lazy, but I don't know if it's laziness or just efficiency, right? To me, I think it's just efficiency. Like people shorten things to be able to communicate ideas faster. Now, this is a big grammar mistake that you don't want to make on a test. Um, but I will confess that I do talk like this. I do make this mistake and I'm also not very concerned about it because I totally 100% understand that languages evolve. And if lots of people are starting to do the same thing, this is a, this signals an evolution in the language. And I do not resist evolution in a language. A lot of people do. A lot of people are like puritanical about how languages are. They say, no, that's not grammatically correct. We shouldn't do that. 
But what people don't realize is that languages are in constant evolution. If you read Shakespeare, that was modern English, you know, all those hundreds of years ago. Languages change. And I'm sure those people would complain about how we speak English today, <laughs> right? Exactly. It's inevitable. Languages are going to change. And, you know, so that's, so when people talk about mistakes, I just like to bring that up because uh, I think it's a, it's a perspective that should be considered. Because there are grammatical mistakes, there are um, communicational mistakes, like maybe non-native speakers are just too blunt. Like they don't have a way of softening their, their language. There can be cultural mistakes. Like for example, if you comment on a person's weight and say, oh, you're fatter, you know, <laughs> um, that's not something we do in English. That is not considered appropriate or, or good at all. But yet people do it because in their cultures and in their countries, it's just a common, it's like, oh, you're fatter or, oh, you're skinnier, you know? And usually that's a very, like weight is a very touchy subject among um, English speakers. So that's a mistake. Um, then you have pronunciation mistakes. I will say like one particular mistake that I think a lot of people make, and it's super easy to fix, is they forget to add the, the, the S in a construction like she runs, like, she runs every day. They will say like, she run every day. Okay. That is such a simple, simple, simple mistake and it could be fixed. But by eliminating that little sound, it takes your English down a level and it just makes you sound, you know, like uneducated or like, like you don't really know English, even though maybe you understand a lot. I know people that have been living in the USA for decades and they still make this mistake you know, and it's like, just add the S sound. You will sound so much better when you do. What kind of advice would you give to those who uh, are preparing for their international language tests with a mm -hmm. uh, limited amount of time? Okay. Well, first, I actually want to back up and say that if your future is on the line, you want to take your time with something because it's like there's no sense in rushing something that, especially if you have a greater chance of failing, if you're going to fail because you rushed it and you weren't patient enough to take that extra year to study or whatever it costs, then that could push your plans back even further. A lot of people aren't willing to wait for results, right? But success is usually exponential. So for example, if you have success on your exam, you get to take the next step in your life and in your career and your success can go up exponentially. But if because you rush something and you weren't fully prepared, now instead of going up, you're going down and it's pushing your plans back further. And that experience can discourage you and maybe it can happen again. And then you struggle with all this you know, negative mindset of I just can't pass this test or whatever. So first I want to say, don't rush it. If you don't have to, if you can push your plans back, what is it? Six months? What is like, what is a year compared to the span of your entire lifetime? Think about it that way. I know sometimes we want instant satisfaction, but that's just, you know, the reality when people rush something they're not truly ready for, and then they fail. That's, you know, that could have been avoided. So first I'll say that. And then, um, as far as preparing for the test, you want to give the examiners exactly what they're looking for. So you have to become an expert in what this test wants. And you have to realize that what the test wants may not be related to normal everyday English. Maybe the test makers think it is, but I've seen lots of official tests and stuff and they can be even hard for me. I had to take um, official tests in Argentina when I was going to study in a university there in order to get accepted to the, to the translation program, English, uh, Spanish translation program. Mm -hmm. I had to do a series of tests and I failed a super easy test because I did not follow the directions. So that's one. I failed a writing test for writing two pages when I was supposed to write like a hundred words <laughs> for an answer. So follow the directions. Um, and then the other thing is there were lots of sentences where I was like, this just is weird. The construction of it, it's not like everyday English. So you have to get comfortable with those kinds of sentence structures that are going to be in tests. It's very academic. It's a different kind of English. It might not be your average everyday English, but you have to get comfortable with that. So you have to know what the expectations are and you have to give them what they want, not what you think they want or not what you think they should want. Um, and find, find professionals that can help prepare you and just be very weary of um, people that say that they prepare for this exam, but they don't, but they're not really experienced. The problem is that there are so many intermediate and advanced English learners um, 
and they get really good at understanding English, but they have nobody to speak with. And there are actually so many ways you can start speaking with native English speakers today. There are online communities that are full of English speakers talking about things that you're already interested in. You know, whatever your interests and your goals are, there are online secret communities where people are gathering and talking about this. Um, and I like to encourage people to, um, mix English in with their, with their goals. Okay. So don't just study English to study English, use English to talk about things you actually care about. Use English to talk about, to talk with people that you enjoy. 